When you're an evil empire, you're bound to piss some people off. When those people have access to ships and shipyards, you're bound to build up a rebel fleet. Or as Leia put it, The more you tighten your grip, Tarkin, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will lay out a complete canon timeline of the buildup of the Alliance fleet. Some details are vague, but for many capital ships and starfighters, there's enough detail to know the exact location and year that they were acquired. So we'll start from the beginning, even before the Empire was formed with a delegation of 2000. This was created just months before the Clone Wars came to an end, and was a group that stood to challenge Palpatine's emergency powers. The powers that the Supreme Chancellor would indeed use to make himself Emperor. Notable members of this group were Mon Mothma, Bail Organa, Padme Amidala, and Mina Tills. Each of their worlds would become prime suppliers of rebel ships and supplies. The fully formed Rebel Alliance would not come about for another decade and a half, but there's some notable figures before that that need to be highlighted. Birch Teller's Rebel Cell may have been the most impactful, operating around 14 BBY, just five years after the Clone Wars ended. Teller himself was a captain in Republic Intelligence, and trained the local population on Antar 4 to fight the CIS with the use of guerrilla-style hit-and-run tactics. When he saw how the Empire subjugated the alien population that was loyal to the Republic, he became disillusioned and applied those same tactics to the New Order. The fleet he amassed was quite impressive. His flagship was a heavily modified Providence-class dreadnought, and he may be the very first rebel to pirate a Nebulon B escort frigate. He also acquired a handful of Z-95 headhunters and Tykar starfighters. Remember, he was the guy training allies how to counteract the CIS military, and this knowledge helped him to take several squadrons of vulture droids and droid tri-fighters. If that wasn't impressive enough, this RIA agent and his rebel cell were able to steal Tarkin's personal ship, the Carrion Spike, a ship with the best cloaking technology in the galaxy. Their legacy also includes a lot of holonet slicing, where they would spread videos of the Empire's brutality on remote worlds. But really, after they were defeated, their fleets were just dispersed and destroyed. This didn't become a direct contribution to the Rebel fleet. The next couple of years would see the rise of Night Swan, who became a respected adversary to Admiral Thrawn. But again, this fleet would also not be incorporated into the Greater Alliance. This is where the Organas come into play. The royal family was able to purchase many ships for their own personal use, and these would be allowed weapon rights as they would be carrying VIPs. Alderaan always had a strong sense of identity outside of the Republic, and especially against the Empire, in part due to their expertise at navigating the political world. These weapon extensions would stay on even under the Empire, and of course Bale and Leia would arrange for these ships to be periodically stolen by pirates. It actually serves two purposes. You can prove to the public and Empire that you need ships with weaponry, because you keep getting robbed by pirates. And of course, this just keeps supplying the Rebellion with the ships and weapons they need. Ironically, this was the exact game plan of the Trade Federation, and is how they ended up with what was in effect the largest navy in the galaxy. By the year 4 BBY, Phoenix Cell was under the command of Jun Sato. His rebel sector fleet included 5 CR-90s and a Pelta-class frigate. It is unclear where they got the medical frigate, but I think that it's plausible that this too was the result of the Organas. Alderaan was known for its humanitarian work across the galaxy, so you can imagine the Imperial Senate allowing these ships to travel around giving aid as a sort of mobile hospital. It would be great PR for the Empire to allow this. So like with the CR-90s, all Organa had to do was give up when and where they would be traveling. Santo would have the Phoenix home retrofitted with extra weaponry, which is true for a lot of Rebel ships. But keep in mind that even if the Empire declawed all the vessels given to civilian groups, it would always be easier for the Rebels to smuggle illegal weaponry, but it's kinda hard to smuggle an entire ship. You could put a laser cannon in a cargo storage, but not a whole Pelta class. As for starfighters, at this point the main ship was the A-Wing. Its history is a bit complicated and we cover it in the RZ-2 breakdown, but the R-22 spearhead was made by Kuat to replace the Delta-7. The Empire rejected it, but allowed it to be sold to the monarch of the remote Outer Rim world, Tammuz An. In the Rebels' search for ships and fighters, they came across the King of Tammuz An, who was willing to make a couple spearheads disappear for the right amount of credits. These were then heavily modified by Rebel pilots into what they called the RZ-1 A-Wing. Hera had been one of those Rebels without an alliance back before 12 BBY, and sometime around there she acquired the Ghost. This was of course added to the Rebel fleets as the Spectres joined the Greater Alliance in 4 BBY. After losing the Phoenix home to Darth Vader's TIE advanced attack, Sato took a CR-90 as his flagship. 
Captain Rex would be discovered alive, and when he joined the Rebel Alliance, he provided the locations of numerous Republic and CIS assets that contained various ships. What do you know? Rex's codes worked. This intel would lead to the introduction of countless smaller ships and vehicles over the next decade, including ARC-170s, Delta-7s, Headhunters, and even transports like LA-80s and the Sheathapede and Taylander shuttles. Later that year, Harrow would discover the Mon Calamari engineer Quarry and learn to fly his prototype B-Wing. This would just be a drop in the water compared to the eventual Calamari contributions. And it was Bail Organa who personally contacted a sympathetic manufacturer at Slane and Corporal to have the ASF-01 B-Wing produced from this prototype. When Leia learned of Vader's devastating attack on Sato's cell, she arranged for three Sphirna-class corvettes to be stolen by the Spectres. Also, keep in mind that throughout this timeline, civilian cargo ships like the GR-75 were being regularly incorporated into the fleets from various sources, as well as Nebulon B escorts which were acquired via raids on Imperial shipping lanes. 3BBY saw the Spectres face off against Mandalorian Fen Rao, but this eventually led to the addition of several Fang fighters. Then the Free Ryloth movement helped the Rebels pirate a Quasar Fire-class carrier. This was essential to house their growing starfighter complement while also keeping it mobile, and it even became the flagship, the Phoenix Nest. In 2BBY, we get the addition of the Y-Wing bomber. A secret Imperial salvage yard where thousands of Republic starfighters are being dismantled for scrap. The planet Yarma had an Imperial salvage yard, and though they were discovered by the Empire, Thrawn allowed them to escape, taking five Y-Wings with them, in hopes of tracking them to the entire Rebel fleet. The Rebel fleet, composed of three star cruisers, have come to the rescue. That is not the Rebel fleet. That same year, Iron Squadron would join the Alliance, adding their YT-2400 into the mix. This year also saw the most pivotal moment in the creation of the Rebel Alliance. Mon Mothma, one of the leaders of the Delegation of 2000, decided to publicly resign from the Senate in order to lead the Rebel Alliance. Over Dantooine, she signs her Imperial Death Warrant by broadcasting over Holonet a call for a unified rebellion against the Empire. The result was an assembly of eight CR-90s, five Nebulon Bs, four Sphirna class, two GR-75s, and most interesting, the Mon Calamari ship, the Home One. You see, way back in 18 BBY, just one year into the Imperial era, Vader was sent to subjugate Mon Cala. King Lichar used his most trusted military minds, Radis and Akbar, to defend their world from invasion. Their brilliant Mon Cala engineers knew that they could not hold off the Empire for long, so they started to convert their enormous city structures into ships. As Tarkin's bombardment intensified, Radis ordered five MC-80As to try and push through the blockade. Three were able to escape, and with the converted city ships, the MC-75 Star Cruisers, they collectively made up what was called the Mon Cala Mass Exodus. Their rendezvous point was in the Talaris Cometary Cloud. Here they would convert several of these ships again, now turning them into what was called the Talaris Star Docks. The first to get a complete retrofit was the Profundity, which became Radis's flagship. The second was the MC-80A that would be known as the Home One, and commanded by Akbar. With Akbar's response to the Mon Mothma's call, the Mon Calamari diaspora was officially a part of the rebellion. I like to think that at this very moment, Palpatine felt a deep tremor in the Force. These two fish folk, Kaken and Sholin, were the ones that secretly communicated with Dornian Brahaket Fleetworks to secure some of their gunships. Radis decided to send some of these ships over to General Jan Dodana in preparation for the raid on the Thai Defender manufacturing plant on Lothal. By now, Ezra had gained possession of Darth Maul's Comerc-class fighter, and he was able to use it during the disastrous evacuation of Adalon when Grand Admiral Thrawn arrived. Besides his Comerc, only the Ghost, two Hammerheads, the CR-90 the Liberator, and some Starfighters were able to escape. This loss was devastating, but this pressure would lead to the Rebels' acquisition of a ship that would come to symbolize their movement. The T-65B X-Wing was developed by Incom Corporation, and the Empire allowed their sale to some planetary defense forces. Due to their great firepower and strong shields, the Empire kept a close eye on these, and is one of the ships that they were able to keep out of Rebel hands the longest. But the betrayal would come from within Incom itself. As the Empire continued to nationalize ship and weapon manufacturers, the company realized they were next. Now their goals aligned with the Rebels, and just months before they too were nationalized, Income lost several shipments of T-65B X-Wings and the new UT-60D support craft. 
Some would be used by the Partisans led by Saul Guerrero, while Hera would lead Green Squadron during an assault on Thrawn's Super Star Destroyer, the Chimera. This was in the year 1 BBY, and it led to the iconic X-Wing and Y-Wing combo that the Alliance Starfighter Corps would deploy countless times thereafter. The next year would see the Battle of Scarif, followed almost immediately by the Battle of Yavin. Over Scarif, the Rebels would suffer the largest defeat since Adalon, with several varieties of capital ships being lost that day. And with the Death Star's destruction, you could have called it the Revenge of the Incom Corporation. In the Year Zero, the Empire would lead two counterattacks on Vrogas Voss and the Mako Ta space docks. Vrogas Voss contained a refueling base, and nearly all of the Rebel assets there were destroyed. Here we saw the Rebels were in possession of a T-47 airspeeder, though they may have had some before that, since Saul's partisans also had T-47s on Jeddah. Eighteen years after the invasion of Mon Cala, King Lee Char was killed while in Imperial custody. This led to a revolt on his watery homeworld, with 12 more cruisers escaping to join the Alliance fleet. They met at the Mako Ta space docks, but when a traitor gave away its location to the Empire, Vader arrived with an Imperial fleet and laid waste to countless ships. The scrambled group of rebel fighters included Wedge Antilles and Luke, who named this group Rogue Squadron in memory of Jin Erso and her team. Many of the leadership, including Leia, Han, Luke, Mothma, and Akbar, all met up in the Kaleida Nebula. From there, they would eventually set up a base on Hoth, but when this was destroyed, you can say that the Rebellion finally gained its most important YT model, the YT-1300 known as the Millennium Falcon. Though Han never considered himself a rebel even after the Battle of Yavin, and even while on the base at Hoth, the Falcon was definitely a rebel ship under Lando, and when Han is rescued, he never thinks about abandoning the Alliance. Almost all of the ships previously mentioned would play a part in the attack on the second Death Star. And after its destruction, they would continue on to destroy other Imperial assets like Kuat Drive Yards, eventually leading up to the Battle of Jakku. After this, most of these ships would reach an eventual retirement in the service of the New Republic. So that's it for the complete canon timeline of the build-up of the Rebel fleet. As for behind-the-scenes facts, just know that of course there are a ton of other ships and vehicles that were added to the Rebellion in various ways, but some just have no backstory, or come from mobile games and are still technically considered canon. And then of course, this story is different in Legends. But with the end of Rebels and some of the comic series, we were able to make this canon timeline, and there were additional facts from numerous canon novels and guidebooks. If you want to pick any of those up, be sure to check out the description below. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support this channel without it costing a thing, or check out our Patreon, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, the more oppressive the ruler, the more impressive the rebellion, and the force will be with you, always.